Chair statement. This meeting is being recorded by the Charter Chapter 7-7 and 7-8 Review Ad Hoc Committee. If any other persons present are doing the same, you must notify the chairperson, me, at this time. In accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 20, Subparagraph G, no person shall address a meeting of a public body without permission of the chair, and all persons shall, at the request of the chair, be silent. No person shall disrupt the proceedings of a meeting of a public chair. If after clear warning from the chair, a person continues to disrupt the proceedings, the chair may order the person to withdraw from the meeting. And if the person does not withdraw, the chair may authorize a constable or other officer to remove the person from the meeting. Since this is a Zoom meeting, that's not a remedy that I have at my disposal. However, I would adjourn the meeting if it got too disruptive. Um, I just wanna say for those that are here from the public, um, Tonight, the public is not invited to speak. However, I'm very grateful that anyone here from the public other than the members of the committee are here to listen. Hopefully we can have at least one public hearing with, uh, within this committee to hear what folks think about what we're discussing, but we haven't even gotten off the ground yet. So let's give us a chance. Um, okay, roll call. David Singer, present. Catherine. Here. Present. Derek Healy. Uh, Danny? Here. Ashley? Isaac? Here. Al? Here. Al, I see Mary Byrne is here. Councilor Healy's here, just for the record. I was muted. Oh, okay. Are you on the phone? I am, yeah. I'm, I'm still driving, so. Okay, be careful. Okay. Uh, Bluetooth does wonders. Yeah, it does. Okay, so um, there are no minutes to accept. There are no public hearings tonight. So um, I thought I would just start off by making uh, a short statement about my vision of this committee. Um, I will be the chair and facilitator, but I'm really hoping, um, you know, we were all handpicked for this committee and I'm really hoping that all of you will feel free to, um, feel free to speak up and uh, I'd like it to be an all-inclusive um, committee. Um, my goal is that at minimum, we can reach a consensus on um, what we think about um, Article 7-7 of the Charter. I know that the title of the committee also has 7-8, but um, in fairness to the uh, election uh, proceedings of a year and a half ago, I would like to put that as a second piece of business and have the committee decide whether they want to proceed to discuss that or not. But we are going to discuss 7-7. Um, so um, I don't know. Um, I think maybe I'll just give a little bit of a history of the, of the charter. Um, I do have um, institutional knowledge of it. Yes, Danny. Can we also, um, can you just, especially for the folks that are listening, outline what happens after we reach the consensus, what our opinion does, like sure. we're not, yeah, we're not creating law here. Correct. I hope we can all agree. The first thing we can reach consensus on is that if we re if we're able to reach consensus, we will provide that opinion to the uh, appointments and ordinances committee of the city council, and then they will take it from there. So we don't have the power to do anything other than to make a recommendation. And as I said, we are, we're all handpicked because we all, I believe, represent a different part of our community that can add a lot to the conversation. Um, anything else that anybody suggests? Okay, so I'm just gonna, so in 2003, we, we created a city charter and that charter changed our form of government from a town to a city. And it created, um, it, it, what it did was it created a mayoral form of government rather than a select board form of government. And it reduced the number of city councilors who are our representative body from 27 to 13. Um, in this, in this um, charter, which is, I, I call it our kind of our local constitution, um, we are represented all of us by both an executive branch person, the mayor, and we're represented, uh, Danny, can you get that? And, and we're represented um, 
by precinct and at large by counselors who run for election and get voted in. The council split into two groups. Every two years, we have an election on an off year, an odd year, and the counselors and the mayor um, are in office unless they resign or retire for four year terms. Um, because, we're an because we're a representative form of government uh, versus uh, the town meeting, which would be the other, ed other side of that type of governing where everybody has a say at, 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 in our governance and a vote uh, at town meeting, the charter did reserve certain rights to the voters. And those rights are in section seven dash, uh, in article seven of the charter. And the reservation of rights that we're going to talk about are the rights of citizens to initiate petitions and come before the city council, ask them to actually, uh, well, after review by the, the city lawyer, ask the, um, ask the council to either approve or not approve what the petition is asking the council to do. If it's approved, then it's an action of our legislative body and it counts like any other action of the legislative body um, subject to referendum petition, ironically, under section 7-8. But regardless, it's, it's, a, it's just that it's brought up from uh, citizens. If it is not approved by the city council, then the way the charter is written today is that um, the petitioners have to go out and get additional votes in addition to the petition number of votes. And once those numbers are reached, then the request is automatically put on the ballot, either by special election or at the next uh, biennial election. So it's a reservation of rights provision, just like 7-8 is, but again, we're not gonna get into 7-8, but they're both, they're kind of cousins. So, um, so what? So we had we had the the petition uh, the petition proceeding resulted in a um, a uh, a no vote for the section seven eight to be changed. So nothing is happening with section seven eight at this point. But there were some in the community that have asked for section seven seven to be placed on the ballot in similar form. Um, I will say that um, while I, I love the idea of petitioning our government and having um, issues put on the ballot, I, I felt that that direct, um, that direct line would only create what I thought was created by the prior petition was kind of hard feelings among the community and not a real avenue for discussion ahead of the, of the matter being put on the ballot. Just kind of came, was on the ballot, then we everybody had to kind of Fend for themselves about what what each what the uh, what the charter provision meant, what the charter change meant. So, I thought that maybe what we should do is have a community discussion, public community discussion, with people like ourselves in front of the community, being welcomed to participate both by listening and at times participating, where we might take a step back and examine. Uh, what a city form of government is like, um, what this provision was meant to do, and um, see if we could find in the beginning some starting point of concept as to what 7-7, why is 7-7 in the charter? What's it trying to do? It, what are the balance points that balance points that we might think about in drafting such a provision? And then get into the sum and substance of it where people might say, well, I want the numbers to be this amount or I want the numbers to be that amount. What does that mean? What does that mean? I'm just concerned that if we just have kind of the same debate that we had with the 7-8, um, that we'll just end up sort of talking at each other and um, you know, telling each other that you're wrong and you're wrong and this is not how we should do it. And, that. and it, I, it just, just feels like it just feels like the wrong way to go. I think there's a lot of good things happening in Greenfield. I think there's a lot of good ideas out in Greenfield, including all the ideas that are, we're gonna hear about on this, on this subcommittee. And I think it's a good opportunity to uh, role model what it's like to uh, talk things out. So with that in mind, before we get into some and substance, does anybody else wanna add anything? If you do, raise your little hand. Al.
You're on mute, Al. David, thank you. I'm. I'm. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I can. Thanks. Um, I want to. I want to emphasize a couple of things, David. I, I appreciate your comment at the beginning about uh, Section Seven Eight, uh, because of all the controversy and angst that it created uh, last November. Um, I do want to respect what the voters uh, said. We, uh, a number, a number of us, uh, David, yourself, and and I, and others, said that. Um, we would leave this to the voters to decide because this this is a voter mechanism. We're, what we're talking about tonight with seven seven uh, is also a voter mechanism. These are these are things that are uh, allow direct democracy to happen in, in our small town city. Um, and is I know it's very important to everybody that's that's on this committee. Otherwise, you you wouldn't have offered to be on it. Um, but I think that. Um, the the vote the vote that happened last November to me is 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 um, important to acknowledge and to respect um, because uh, when we offer the hand uh, out to to the the voters saying we want you to decide and then they decide I want to respect that I, I want to give that very deep credence um, because I think that it's it's important to acknowledge that you are the voters are. The consent of the governed is is important, and that you you are you are um, an important piece of this mechanism that makes our democracy work. Um, having said that, I also agree with David that I I believe that seven seven um, can be uh, created uh, uh, consensually out of this committee uh, recommended to the back to the ordinances committee. I believe that uh, seven seven that while it's flawed um, in in the way it's currently written. Um, and I believe we will go into that, all the reasons why it's uh, um, you know, way too complicated and, and cumbersome. But I do believe that this group of people could come up with a consensus. Uh, I'm ready to work towards that um, as the main function of this group. Um, and, uh, and to remind people that the, the charge that, that we received from the chairman of the ordinances committee was to come up with recommendations, if any, about about these items. So I believe that we do we do have ones that we can come up with for seven seven, uh, and I, I look forward to focusing on that. Um, and uh, I was one of the people who uh, uh, about seven or eight months ago uh, had written an email to the charter review committee, maybe even longer, saying I'd like seven seven and seven eight both to appear uh, before the voters because they are the voters' mechanism. So. Uh, that decision um, was made only to do not only seven eight, but just a section, uh, a, a sentence of section eight, was what finally made it on the ballot, and uh, it was a section about numbers, uh, which uh, therefore can lead to some confusion. But I just want to say right at the outset that um, I'm I'm supporting uh, the 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 idea that we would try to come up with a consensus. I'm supporting that we can do it uh, on seven seven. And I'm supporting what David said about making seven eight uh, much, le much less of a focus and consequential on this meeting because, to me, that would be uh, le lead to many serious problems about uh, the confidence of the voters that we took them seriously. Thank you, David. Thanks, Al. Anybody else want to say anything before we begin? Oh, I'm sorry. Isaac, Isaac has his hand up. I see your hand. Yes, Isaac. Isaac has his little hand up. Okay, I figured out how to unmute. Uh, Dave, I just wanted to add to your history of the charter that in 2014, the voters voted to extend the terms of the councilors from three years to four years, which was not contemplated in 2003 when the original charter was written. So that, that I think that's important to note about sort of the underlying pinnings of the importance of citizen participation. The other thing I want to say is when we talk about the will of the voters at the last referendum. I think it's important to note they were they were were asked to vote on a specific change to 7-8, not whether or not 7-8 should be changed in any way. There may be ways that we all agree that it should be changed, or maybe we don't, there won't be anything we think needs to be changed. But I think we're charged with looking at it and and while it doesn't need to be something we take up tonight, we it should be looked at at least. And I'll try to take my hand down if I can figure out how to do that. All right, you can just tell me you're done. Thanks. Catherine. I did it for you. 
so I, I do have questions about the history and about the different numbers and language, but I, well, first question is we're not talking in detail yet. We're talking about the purpose of this body. Is that, is that right, David? You mean we're not talking in detail? When you said, do we have any questions? Um, do we have no, any do you questions? Have to add? I, I guess, let me, let me put it a different way. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe this, from your own feeling about how you view the committee, subcommittee, do you have anything to add about what role you want to play or how you visualize this process? Sure. Um, I think my mind has been spoken multiple times here. So I don't need to add that. Um, okay. Just one quick question. If we don't come to consensus, consensus can be something that can be quite hard to reach, <laughs> even amongst people who are believe they're already starting on the same page. So if we don't come to consensus, we just give that information to the to A. I, I hope that we do too. And I also believe that's possible. But just to have clarity from the outset, um, if that weren't to happen, we would do we know what the what the ending point is, or how do we know that we haven't gotten there? Or um, and not to be negative, but just to be know that we're on the same page in terms of the context of what we're doing together. Yeah, I, I well. It's a subcommittee, so you know we're kind of down in the, you know, it's it doesn't have to be quite as formal as the the committees above us. But I thought that if we could set a goal for consensus, it means that that's what we're going to push for. And if we reach a point where, you know, I as the chair say, you know, it doesn't seem like we can reach consensus. Um, is there anybody who wants one last chance at it and? those that differ are not willing to alter or don't have any ideas about things that we can reach consensus on, then we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I would like to present a positive statement from this committee. And disagreeing isn't necessarily a negative statement as long as we disagree on principle and not on name calling or you know characterizations. It's gonna be on, we disagree on the principles, which I think, is something that I expect may happen, but I also believe that um, you know it's time. I think it's time to move on from this. So if this group can really do its work and we can get some movement where people don't love it but they'll accept it, that's what I'm hoping for. But that's just my first volley, and it's a good question. I'll, I'll have and and in terms of duration, um, I don't I don't really want this to take a terribly long amount of time because I think that. We can have, we can, I think we can do this in a relatively short period of time, but I don't want to time it because I want to see where it goes. I'm very interested and um, I want Al and I really to be sort of on the same page with this. I'm really interested in us reaching some kind of resolution on 7-7 that will show the community kind of what, how we should think about this stuff. And then we'll let others make other decisions. So that's what I'm hoping that we can, we can figure that out. So I uh, hope I've answered you, Catherine, but you can keep me on track if you wish. All right, so let's get to the substance of it. Um, again, we're not, we're not, seven, eight is off the table now, um, which is good because it all references seven, seven and nobody can understand it anyway. I have to say that um, let's just accept that this is a legal document and that's why it's written the way it's written that there are statutes, if, if a charter does not have language about, about um, citizen initiative measures in it, you can go to state law and there are statutes and Catherine, if you'd like the sites, I'm happy to give them to you that dictate how you would proceed. So when towns or when cities write these, they kind of take from that, from that, from those statutes and try to imitate on some levels what the statutes say. And then over time, we all imitate each other. So we took this from a city charter, somebody takes it from us, not to say it's the right way or wrong way, but you know, that's, that's what we've done. And I think to Al's credit, he's read this and said, you know, I'm coming from a different perspective. It doesn't have to really read this way. And, and I, I understand that, but I just wanna keep in mind that this is a legal, this, the charter is a legal document. So we have to be careful that we're not writing it in such a way that we're defeating its whole purpose by having it not be written lawfully. So 
just let's just start off with the fact that this is written in a burdensome way and try to understand it. Okay. So an initiative measure, now I'm gonna back up one second. There is a section 7-6 and 7-6 is kind of the baby step way of getting before the city council with an initiative, but it doesn't carry the same weight, but it requires the city council to pay attention to a group of people who wanna be heard by the city council. Nobody's, we're not talking about that section, but just so you know, there's a baby version of this. So if you don't wanna go that way, or you've gone before the city council and you don't like the result, I would think that you, would, if, I were the, if I were that group, I would go to this section, I'd say, okay, this section has teeth. So this is what we're going to try to do. So you start the, the subsection A, and I think when we, the, so this was what was in the original charter when it was passed in 2003. It was changed in 2015 or 16, only as to the percentages and timelines, but it was not changed to the rest of the wording. So we'll go through it, learn it, and then we'll go to 7.7 as it was amended, and then we can see what we think of that. So it has to start in a formal way where there's at least 10 people and accompanied by an affidavit, and they want the city council to, to look at a, what we'll call a measure something that they need to vote on, something that they have jurisdiction to pass for the benefit of our community. Um, that starts everything going. So that all you need are 10 people, five file an affidavit, you hand it to the clerk, clerk sends it to the town city lawyer, lawyer looks at it and says, that's okay. Has to do that within 15 days, I believe. And then the clerk's office prepares a petition. And the petition has the the measure that you want to have considered. And then it has like any other petition and there are examples of petitions that have been given to you in the, I think uh, in the packet that Tammy sent. That's what a petition looks like. You, it's like you did when you ran for office, you sign it, precinct, and you have to get a certain amount of signatures. <laughs> so in the early charter, within 90 days following the date, um, that the forms were actually issued to those 10 people, you had to get 10% of the total number of voters, which I am translating as registered voters, um, on the petition to get it before the council. Now in today's work, in, in, in those days, well, the numbers were different, but I know Catherine, you asked a question today. I, I'm, I, Al, you can correct me, but I believe there's around 13,000 registered voters, more or less. Let's, let's use that as a round number, maybe there's more. It's a little higher. Okay. Is, is it a number high enough that we should round it up a little bit or just? Well, it's around 13.5, 13.511. Oh, okay. So 13.5. Let's say that's, so that's a number that we should be aware of. 13.5. So if, if that were in effect today, you'd have to get that many people to sign the petition within 90 days. You then bring it back to the clerk. There's a board of registers that are the people like you're seeing now in the elections across the country. They're the ones who check the petition with the voters and make sure that the proper people have signed off. And if there's enough signatures, if, uh, if there's enough proper signatures, then it moves to the um, city, it moves to the city council. Now you can do this with the school committee as well, but let's just focus on the city council. Um, let's see. Within 30 days, so within 30 days, the city council then has to bring it up and act on it. So you can say you agree with it or not agree with it. If you amend it materially, it's considered you don't agree with it. And that gives the group the right to go out and get an additional, in the old days, it would be an additional 5% of registered voters on top of the 10% of voters to sign another petition that would then come uh, into the council, into the clerk's office. And if and you were able to achieve that result, then uh, the council could either put it up for special election or it would go on the ballot in the next election. Danny? And can I, can I just add like within that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but acting upon it, the council acting upon it, this can take a while because it could mean moving it, you know, referring it to the appropriate committee where they discuss it. That could take a month. 
maybe two going no, back it says, to it says it says they have, they have to act within 30 days they have to act upon it but doesn't act upon it mean start action i i don't know usually we read that as start an action so acting okay. upon the petition that's fine that's so fine. i'm just saying like just just in terms of, like we all agree like like not only was that a high number of signatures but that this part won't change is that these things sometimes this is more for the for the uh benefit of the citizens sort of watching the meeting too like they don't just put it on the agenda that next council meeting and be like yes or no no but it has to it has to start moving through the system so that people yes. see that that's being worked on yes okay and if it's rejected you have to get a supplemental petition in order to in today's charter you have, uh, and both both the original charter and the amended charter have that requirement. Um, and then you can see there's a form of a question. So you say Dave, yes or no, the question is put on there. Somebody interrupting me? Yeah, th this is Isaac. Yes. I'd, I'd like a little bit of clarity. I, I don't think Danny is correct. I think the council has to vote within 30 days. If it doesn't, it's failed to act or it has ah. failed or it's rejected the measure. So you I think that's right, Isaac. I think that timeline is meaningful. I think it can't just be referred to committee. And I think that's put in there so that the council doesn't just sort of bury it in subcommittee. You're, I think you're right. Yep. Okay. That's Thanks, what I thought, Isaac. but I wasn't. I, I was, no, I was, this is good. Argue with me. That's why I brought it up. Great. Okay. So you have. David, David excuse me. One other, yes, one other clarification. Um, <clears throat> what you're, what you're looking at, I'm uh, looking at page three of the, of the handout that uh, Tammy put together. This is the, just correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, this, this appears to be the section 7-7 that was put into place early on in 2003 or so. That's what I said. And yes. so it's not what we have now in the charter. So I'm not, I, we may be confusing people by starting further back because the charter now reads differently than what you're going through. And I don't know whether we want to. I think it's smart more. to have the history. I, I mean, I think that's what he's doing, but. I guess I want people to know where we started and where we are. People think, there are some people that think it's, it needs to be changed. And I'm showing that before 2016, this was the world we were living in. And, and then it was changed. Both sections 7, 8 and 7, 7 were changed to make them, um, I guess, I don't know if easier is the right word, but to be more friendly to the public. And I think it's important that the community understands that. There's not, I'm not, I have nothing, people can make up their own minds whether they like number 2003 or 2016, but there definitely was, it was, it was a hot, my calculations are that you needed, in today's world, you would have need, you would need 1950 signatures in order to get a uh, petition onto the ballot. Okay. That's you're talking about you. You're talking about using today's voter voter numbers. You mean today's right. voter numbers with okay. two thousand. Well, the same. It would be nineteen hundred and fifty mm -hmm. people. The the only so just point remember, I want, just, just remember that. I mean, people. I think people can handle that. We're, yeah. I don't. I I only raise the point because I've had uh, some comments from people that that is section is page three and four or whatever. Is that what the charter currently reads? And the answer is no. It, this is not the. The, the version that uh, was before the Charter Review Committee in 2019. It's not what we're looking at starting from. Uh, it's an earlier version. And I, David, I understand why you want to do that, but I just want to point out that there are some major changes that took place in the document we're looking at now, uh, such as in this section on supplemental. Well, why don't, why don't we, can we wait till we get there and then you can help me with that? That's fine, sure. Thanks. And the current charter as it is legal now is on the city website. Correct. and gets updated when changes occur. Correct. To simplify it, everyone who's listening, just take those numbers and say, this is what it used to be. And that's all you need to know because then we'll go to the new charter and you can see the differences. Okay. And I, I, Al, I'm, I'm, and anybody out there who wants to help me explain it, that's fine. So as far as I, the section A was not changed, Section B was not changed. So it takes 10 people, five affidavit. Um, uh, the city, city lawyer gets to 15 days to review it. Um, let's see. So then you go out, you bring it to the clerk's office and no later than 90 days. So I believe that's the same.
Yep, so that's the same. So within 90 days, now the votes are not less than 10% of the total number of voters voting in the most recent biennial election, but not less than 10% of all registered voters. So it means that at minimum, you're gonna need, um, well, 600, whatever, I had 650 because it used to be 13,000, but maybe Al has that number at his fingertips, but it's- I'm sorry, what, what was the number, David? It's five, it's what five percent. Oh, 13.5 times 0.05. So it's 670. So the minimum amount of people you would need is 675 compared to 1,300. Um, so the reason that there were these two measuring sticks was because there were two measuring sticks that were also put in in section 7.8 and there was a compromise that instead of just counting uh, all registered voters, why don't we have a two-tier system? We'll have, um, you know, if, 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 we'll measure it against people who vote, but if not enough people show up, then at least we have a, a, a floor and the floor is the second percentage. So you're hoping a lot of people show up, you take that because they're the ones who showed up, but if not, if not a lot of people show up, then there has to be a minimum amount of people that we count on the petition. The now in those days, I'm sorry. The 10% 10, 10 of the total number of voters voting in the most recent election. Yeah, that's the first, than, that's I, the first measurement. That's yeah, the first that's measurement. one block. And then the other block is the 5% of registered voters. If you don't reach the 5% of registered voters threshold using the first part, then it's the second part. If, gotcha. you, if you're over in the first reading, then that's the one that stands. Right. Got it. Now, and that's and that's critical. That second one is critical because that floor often comes into play, particularly in off-year elections when you're having uh, these kinds of issues uh, brought up. They're not as they're not as popular as candidate elections where um, the turnout is heavier. But but yeah, the floor the floor often gets invoked because the number of voters voting is smaller than the floor. Um, right I, and. What? I'm sorry, let me say one more fact, Catherine, and then I'm going to have, we used to have elections every year. The council was divided into three parts. The select board was divided. I'm sorry, the mayor was, the, uh, yeah, we, the, so the council was divided into three parts, and every year we had an election. So we always had a measuring stick from the most recent election. So you never went more than a year with the number of voters being calculated as compared to the floor. Now that we vote biannually, if you have a weak turnout in year 2021, that's the full, that's the measuring stick for the next two years. So that's so that wasn't anticipated in the amendment. But in any event, go ahead, Catherine. I'm sorry, I am um, still trying to track this. Um, when you say the floor in the original. I'll, what I I know that in the revised charter there was you know um, there were two numbers equal to ten percent but not less than two and a half percent and I would imagine that that would be a floor but in this one in the original just tracking from the history I'm seeing two numbers I'm seeing that in order to bring the petition uh, at least ten percent of voters was needed. And then plus in order to the supplemental um, needed 5% of the total number. And I just wanna make sure I'm getting that. When I hear the word floor, I'm not quite understanding it in this context and I'm um, confused. And, and I just wanna to add too, um, I was confused. Um, I'm, I'm really interested once we get through this first step to hear what happened in 2015, 2016, because when I read this, I didn't realize um, that there was an inter, there was a time in between, that there was something else in between. So I read this going from 2002 to 2020. So I appreciate the tracking of the history here. That's why I love the history, yeah. You're welcome. When I say floor, I mean that it can't go lower than a certain amount. Because if you're measuring people that turn out, it's gonna be different every, every, every election. 
So you can't have it that if 10, if a hundred people show up, it can't be 10 people get to petition, you know? So it has to be some number that everybody thinks is at least the lowest amount that, that we'll, that the government will feel is a comfortable amount. It could actually be higher. That's the thing. It could be higher. If 10,000 people show up for an election, it's a thousand people. As so, with section seven dash eight as well, by the way, uh, that one's- So the floor could be either of the calculations. Yeah, well, all right, so- Dave, Dave. Uh, yes, I, yes. I know, I know you're walking through this, but maybe this is a good time to ask sort of what people think philosophically on whether or not it needs to be a bifurcated process like that. I sort of understand when you're talking about referendum in 7-8 that you're talking about the people who elected the people who were on the city council. And that argument, I guess, could be made for the people who refused not to act on something that was put before the citizens. But regular citizen initiatives on statewide ballots aren't done in that way, as I understand it. The, the referendums are done in that way. But citizen initiative petitions on for the statewide ballot are, are just a certain number of voters need to be, you, you need to get signatures of to get something on the statewide ballot. Do we, I, I'm, and I'm not, I don't have one opinion or another. I'm curious what other people think about whether or not we could simplify this by getting rid of the bifurcated process. I have an opinion. Hold it, hold it, hold it. I didn't get to the, let me finish the reading okay. of the, section and then I'm happy to do that. Sure. The other change was that when you go out for the supplemental uh, petition, it was lowered to two and a half. So that's another 300 and something votes. So it would take like 900 and something votes would be the floor between the two. Um, so that was the second change. Uh, okay, so I, I, the, the, the agenda only calls for me reading it. So now we can go right into, um, you know, envisioning how, how does how does our government how does our government function? You know, how do you envision our government functioning within this charter provision? David, can I make one comment about a uh, footnote to what you just said about the uh, the supplemental petitions? It, uh, and I do want to talk about what Isaac raised, but not now. But the, the so is it fair to say to explain to people that the um, the two-step process in a in a in seven seven of, of an original petition and then a supplemental ends up adding up to a requirement that you gather uh, a fifteen percent of the voters voting, but not less than seven and a half percent of the total uh, voters uh, registered. In other words, the, the, these two things have to be added up together, or you don't. You don't. You haven't reached the total number of uh, of signatures required. Correct. Is that correct, right? Yes. David? Okay. So, so I think what's important is to remember for folks to remember that again, uh, in terms of some of these benchmarks, that if you're talking about um, a situation where you're uh, you're you're now, if, if you were using the current um, ordinance now, and uh, the number of uh, of, um, of of total registered voters. Um, you you would have to gather uh, uh, a little over a thousand, roughly a thousand thirteen signatures. But I have, but I also believe that the town clerk would tell you. I'm not sure about this, but I think she would say you, if you were going to do a referendum now, you would have to use uh, the figures from uh, 2000 uh, and uh, and uh, 20, um, 21, maybe 2019, which were lower, which were below thirteen thousand. So these numbers are. I think a little bit off, David, because we can't, I don't think we would be using the most recent biennial. I mean, do we count this, uh, the, the most, what are, what is the most recent biennial? Is it, tw is it, uh, 21, 2021? Yes. 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 Okay. So this, this number that we're throwing around today is the number, the 13,511. That's a number that the city clerk, I think is providing about how many voters we have today, but, but we wouldn't use that for this, these petitions. Yeah. So it was, so the number we tossed around during the petition drive was 13,000. Dave, I don't think that's exactly correct. I think when you're looking at the minimum number of registered voters, you're looking at the people who voted, who are registered as of today. When you are looking at the number of people who voted in the most recent biennial election, 
you're looking backwards. So one of them is is anchored to today, and one of them is anchored to the previous oh, election. I, Isaac, I'll read the sentence. It says, the total number okay. of voters voting in the most recent biennial election, but not less than 5% of all registered voters on the same date. Oh. Oh, oh there you go. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. I didn't realize it said that. I, I that's right true. Here. That's true in the second in the second supplemental. It's true. It's two and a half percent of the same oh. number of registered voters as of that date. Yeah, so that's all consistent. Yes, Kathy. I don't think I'd have the same opinion if I before I was a city um, employee, but bam, that moving target seems really annoying for the clerk's office. Um, I did want to make a quick comment on the bifurcated thing just before, and then I'm going to kind of be quiet and listen a, a little more, but. One of the things I was thinking about coming into this meeting was I, my sort of philosophy on the whole thing is what you want with citizen initiatives is for it to be somewhat easy enough for a group of citizens to petition their government if they believe that something needs to be changed without making it so easy that they're, they're, that they're kind of leading by referendum and I think that the language in this, whether the numbers are low or not, is an obstacle to people because look at us, we're all really smart. Two of you guys are lawyers and we're all still stumbling over this, right? So the fact that it's bifurcated, so I'd be open to, I'm not married to it, but I'd be open to a discussion on changing things enough so that maybe it's not a bifurcated two number system. So that just reading this is like, somebody's gonna read this and say, forget it, I'm not gonna do this. It's not accessible. You've got, my, you've got my vote on that, but I, okay. I think you have to understand what you're changing. Yeah. Catherine. I'm sorry, Dana, are you done? Thanks. Catherine? I think I answered my own question. I, I, I will ask the clerk. Um, I'm wanting to see. The history is really helpful. And I'm looking right now at the charter online and I'm imagining that this, it would make sense that this was the one passed in 2020, not 2015. Um, but since I, I see this and I don't see anywhere the 20, I, I'm curious what happened in the intervening years. Um, and so I was going to ask what the, where that is, but I will, I guess, ask Kathy to help me figure that out. I just want to know that history. I, I can answer it. I, I guess I didn't want to be, you know, I, in fairness to everybody else on the committee, I didn't want to be the only historian, but I was on the city council when we passed it. I think, I believe Isaac was as well. After the uh, biomass vote, members, some members, so the, the, a, lot of me, a lot of people who were against the biomass were also swept into office. So they were the people that had had to go out on the street and get petitions signed. And, um, there was some suggestion that the numbers be changed and loosened up. So as a result, there was lots of conversation about how to do it. And the conversation then went to the idea of, do we measure people who voted in the last election or people who were registered voters? So the compromise was to have them both in there, which was a terrible idea. And, um, but as a result, both, sec uh, both sections were modified to be a little bit looser for people to get to the ballot. And that passed in 215 and 216, around 215, 216. So the, the, the reason for it was the, the biomass put people in a state of mind that they thought that um, it should be loosened up. So these two sections are looser in some ways Although ironically, this, this idea of, of measuring people who come out and vote as a higher percentage can, can smack you in the butt. But we, we, at that point in time, maybe 40% of the people ever came out to vote in one election. So everybody measured it against 40% of the registered voters and then wanted to make sure that they had something related to registered voters because the original charter had registered voters as a measuring stick. So they did both, which, uh, sadly, I agreed to, uh, but I can see why it's ridiculous. And one of the things I'd like to come out of this is a clear statement of one set of rules. I mean, if, if Al feels we can't touch 7-8, then so be it. But at least we can touch 7-7 seven, seven and make that easier. But the idea, these, these two things are, it's not so necessary to memorize the two numbers as to understand that 
this is where the number lands, as Al would say. There's probably 950 people that would have to, at minimum, participate in the petition drive. 650 in the first instance. If the city council did not accept it, you'd have to go out and get another 300 and something votes. And so you'd need a total of about 950 votes. When the first charter was written, you needed almost 2,000 votes. So it was reduced. Not saying anything else about it, it's a fact. I'm not editorializing it, but it was reduced. I would like to say that, again, this is a concept that I'd like to discuss and not a mandate or a dogma. The reason for the supplemental, the idea is that you get a group of people who want to do something and they petition the government and that means that the city council must do something within a relatively short period of time, say thumbs up or thumbs down. If they don't do it, I think what Al is promoting and what Danny was talking about and maybe even Isaac is about to suggest is that it goes right to the voters at that point in time. One of the reasons not to do that is to have there be two thresholds. So you can think of it this way. The first threshold should be a relatively easy threshold to get it before the city council so that they can not ignore the will of the people to at least look at what's before them. But to go to petition, I, I think is the philosophy, it means that you have to get more voters so that there's some sort of a bigger groundswell of people who would like it to be, who would like to circumvent your, your legislative government. So that's why there's two, that's why there's two steps. I'm not saying that's, I'm not saying that's the best way or the only way. I'm not, it's, I'm not being at all, but that's the theory is that you get your first kick at the council with a relatively small amount of people, but in order to get it on the ballot, you have to get more people to be interested because if the legislature didn't want to do it, then you need more people, you know, you need to, you need to give, you need to go out and try to get more support for it because you've already elected these people. So that, that's the reason that it is this way. So, Dave, that's not, that's not how I saw it. That is the truth. Well, the, the way I've always viewed it was that the purpose of the first phase was to prevent the city from wasting money on going out to municipal council to find out whether or not something was even legal to present to the voters until there was enough support to show that there was, that this might get to the place where it would have enough signatures. And then, but also to not try to wait till the very end of that process to let people collect all the signatures and then find out that they drafted something slightly incorrectly so that it couldn't go before the voters. And then they had to go all over and collect all of their signatures again. I really thought of the key point in between is the review of municipal council. That's municipal what happens. Council, in municipal council looks at it as soon as you submit it. It doesn't go anywhere. Like if somebody walked in and said, you know, I'd like, to, I, mean, I don't even want to say anything silly. Think of a silly ordinance that somebody wants to do and it's a Everyone illegal. has to wear socks on Tuesday. Whatever. Yeah. And, you know, and so the city lawyer says, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. So it's, de it's dead in the water. So if you read it, be, no, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I respectfully think that the reason is that, again, it's just a philosophy. It doesn't have to be our philosophy but it's a philosophy of government that you really have to go the extra mile to get it on the ballot once you've Dave, had your day with the city council. And Dave, what happens I, in between the two phases? What, what's that? What does the charter call for to happen in between those two collection phases? Well, the first 650 votes count. So now you have to get an additional 350 votes and an extra supplemental petition. And when you do that, it goes to, right to the ballot. Or it goes to the well, city council well, to decide whether to put it on the ballot sooner or later. But what but, happens in between? What happens in between is that the people who brought first brought the petition have to go out and and um, and collect signatures. Mm -hmm. And there's no time limit, by the way. I don't yes, think. there is. There's another. It's two months. You're, you're killing oh, two so more you're right. months okay. of time. Oh, my bad. My bad. My bad. Sixty days. <clears throat> so another two months of time. This process is extremely dilatory, by the way. That I. I charted can we be, that. Can, I we, can we not wait, wait, can we not use we don't need to can we just talk about it as a philosophy dilatory is is just talk of it as a philosophy please dilatory is not a nice word talk
Talk about it. I, as I well. don't. I think that if a process takes, uh, I think all of us are concerned that if a, if a process is going to be sound, it needs to be something that is not, um, uh, you know, elongated and very difficult to accomplish. I think that's what we're talking about. I'll try to use a word that's not pejorative, but the 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 fact is is that. I once timed this out in terms of 60 days here, 60 days there. Th this process could go on almost for a year before, a, you know, a cit citizens would be, be able to finally get to the ballot with something. And I, I, I think that the the um, this bit about a supplemental. What always struck me about it is that it's it is somewhat um, strange to say to people who have already collected, let's say, 600 signatures, that uh, we want to see a greater groundswell from you. Now go out. Uh, we didn't. We didn't exactly adopt your uh, your amendment, so it's been it, it technically is rejected. You have to now go out and gather another three or four hundred signatures from different people. It can't be the you know like Al Norman can't sign it in phase one and and phase two. It has to be different people. So every time I'm handing somebody a petition, I have to say, uh, "Excuse me, Al. Do you remember if you signed this petition before?" And they're going, "Well, gee, I I don't know. What's it about?" I mean, and they're not sure, so they sign it, it gets dis disqualified later, and you find out that you've got scads of people who signed it for a second time innocently. I just think that the 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 rationale for um, the supplemental petition is weak. Uh, the the idea that we uh, we need to hear, we need to be, uh, the, the voters need to be told, okay, now we didn't like your idea, so now go out and collect another uh, to show this, you know, that we there's some kind of groundswell behind you. Uh, we don't we don't do that with anything else in terms of groundswell. Um, you know, tell me how many signatures I have to get to get to you. Tell me whether you like the petition or not. And then if you don't like it and reject it, put me on the ballot. Don't don't make me wait another two months. Uh, it, it, people are exhausted with the first phase. They have to go out and get new people. I just think it's um. I, I think that we're uh, asking too much of a process, and I think the the truth is that this process isn't used very often. And I think part of the reason is because of this very cumbersome process. Okay, I, I you know, I, I get the idea. I get the idea that it's cumbersome, and I cannot disagree that it's cumbersome. The other comments that you made, I can say things too, but it, it's, it doesn't matter. It's not just me. But I think you're right. I think it is cumbersome. And I think that's something we should look at. But I, I would like you to tell me, since you have said that, you don't have to tell me right this second, but if it's cumbersome because you have to go out twice, then we still have to talk about what the threshold is to get it in front of the city council in the first place. Because the way this was written, I believe, was to make the original threshold relatively easy and then the supplemental threshold a little bit harder. If you want to have a one-stop shopping, then the threshold number should be one that is talks about the balance between bringing petitions all the time and bringing petitions that have a groundswell of support. The uh, David, the interesting thing about that is that we don't have a prolific history of initiatives and referendums in Greenfield. It's not like every you know every election cycle we've got two or three uh, petitions uh, uh, put on. I remember. Uh, Isaac, you can fill me in. A few years ago, Isaac put on three three non-binding uh, petitions at once. That's really unusual. I mean that that and they were non-binding, so people understood that uh, their their vote in ultimately was not going to result in anything. Um, Isaac, I don't remember what the issues were at the a particular time. I'd have to look it up. But we don't we don't frivolously go to the ballot in 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 this community. We've never done it. Uh, all the things that I've seen brought forward, whether it was biomass or or plastic bottles, or uh, safe communities, or uh, whatever, um, they've been fairly, I think, fairly uh, uh, significant and, and and good faith efforts to uh, reform government and make it better. So I I don't I don't think that um, I think what, what what we haven't done is say to people, look, you you need to understand that if you want to go on the ballot. Um, the the commencement process isn't going to be overly laborious for you, but we'll tell you what is going to be. You're going to if you want to if you want your petition to pass, you're going to have to form a committee. You're going to have to raise money. You're going to have to get a uh, an IRS uh, a tax exempt number. You're going to have to you know spend money. Right? You're going to have to raise funds. I mean, you've got really the hardest task, and I, I speak from experience on this. 
the hardest task is actually driving your petition to the goal line. That that's the the people that have to stand out on the corners with their lawn signs, spend a couple thousand bucks. One of the things that amazed me, and I don't want to get off the subject here, but one of the things that amazed me about the 2019 uh, um, library referendum is that I don't think the anti-library -li people had any clue what was really involved in running a campaign. It wasn't just gathering signatures. They gathered 400 signatures. The fact is that they did nothing, very little after that, that you have to do to, to prevail. And that, David, that's the, that's the hardest part. Of, of having a referendum or an initiative is actually getting it to the goal line with voters with you. And to, to do that, a lot of citizens are not prepared. Uh, this happened recently in the marijuana thing, which I don't wanna go into, where there was a massive petition of names, um, but the, it was all, it, it had no structure to it. And it wasn't I, even, I, the, our town's lawyer said, you can't, that, this isn't an initiative and it's not a referendum. So I, so it got all of those, all of that name gathering was for no purpose legally, but anyway, I don't think, I think the real groundswell is getting it to the finish line. That's fine. But there are, there's the legislative body that needs to have its, its needs met as well. Yes, Danny. So this is sort of to Al's point initially is that we haven't used this, this uh, vehicle frivolously in Greenfield. He's right. Um, but the things that have happened have been important and have, and it's worked. So in a way, that could argue that the number is not too high um, or, or, and this, I'm kind of, I'm contradicting what I said earlier, or maybe the, diff, the system isn't that difficult if some, if people are figuring out how to do it. Um, I do think it needs to be more accessible to the average person. I hear what you're saying about the campaigning part is the hard part, right? That is, the getting the yeah. signatures is one thing. The campaigning part is the hard part, but that's, I don't think we're going to solve the like kind of process of American elections and democracy in this subcommittee because that's kind of the game. Like that's kind of the way it goes. Like if you're running for office, you have to do that. Even if you're running for a precinct council, um, you have to go out and do that stuff. And the same thing is with citizens initiatives. And I don't know, maybe it's because, uh, you know, I've done that stuff with elections and, and I kind of enjoy it. And I know a lot of people don't, but you know that's kind of what we've si signed up for by participating in elections is that you have to go out there and convince people that what you're what you want to do, what you're putting on the ballot is worth voting yes or no on. Exactly, Isaac. Thanks, Dave. So first of all, I apologize when I said um, it goes to council. I was I don't have the charter in front of me. I'm waiting to go into a to another meeting. I, I looked it up on my phone. What happens is it goes to the council. The council has to vote on it. That's the interim thing. So the first amount is supposed to be the trigger for the council to have to take action. The ideal situation for petitioners is for it never to make the ballot for the council to adopt what they're asking them to do. That's right. what they really want because that right. saves a lot of time, money, and effort. And I think there's some discussion. I think you're right that there should be some discussion about whether or not um, the threshold is in the correct proportion and, and what the threshold should be to just start make the council take a vote on something um, versus, versus getting onto the ballot at the end. So that's a good question for us to discuss. To answer Al's question about questions going on the ballot from councilors, the city council as a body can place questions on the ballot at any time it chooses, both non-binding and sometimes binding questions, absent um, citizen petition. So sometimes the I, I have seen the result of a citizen petition being the count that the council itself put a matter on the ballot rather than require them to collect the additional signatures. Yes. So that's actually another way that people can do that. They can call their city councilor and say, hey, would you sponsor this? How do you feel about this thing? I think about that process all the time. And you know, not to get into the weeds on things, but like people are like, why didn't the mayor do X, Y, and Z? It's like, you have 13 city councilors, four of them are at large, one of them is your precinct councilor, that can put these same things forward all the time as part of their job. Like that is their job, legislating and appropriating money. They, oh. These are two things. With 100 signatures, the city council has to put it on their agenda. Right. 
Right. Well, that's, no, that's, not, yeah. that's not exactly correct either, Danny. There are a number of things that the council has that have to come from the mayor's office that the council can't. Yeah. Yeah, I know, but well, you know what I mean. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean I didn't mean the exceptions. I just meant I didn't. I, I don't mean about like the details of appropriating money and all that stuff. But like ordinance changes, if there's a thing that's going on in town that really needs to be like changed or pigeonholed, or there's an ordinance that doesn't make sense, or there isn't, there's a lack of an ordinance. Like goats, we don't have one. You know, this doesn't have to come from above, nor does it have to come from 1,300 people. Like there are other ways too. And so, I mean, this is a whole other conversation that maybe it's more about public so education. I want, to ask a question. I want to ask a question so I can, you know, I, I think, so on the one hand, you have the ability to petition your government. And if the legislature doesn't agree with you, it goes to the ballot. And then people who aren't that involved have to get involved, otherwise, the people who want it are going to fight like hell to get it. And so now people who have existed in the comfort of a legislative system where I elect my representatives and they get my phone calls and they deliberate about stuff and they decide what to do or not to do. And if I don't like them, I vote them out of office. That's how I'm involved with my government. Every now and then I'll come to a council meeting and I'll give the counselors my point of view. But once you bring something to the ballot, everybody has to get involved. And do we really want to have these two, I mean, do we want to have two separate forms of government? We have this one form of government that's legislating and doing what it wants. And then we have another form of government where people are out there petitioning and, and you have people putting things on the ballot and um, all of us have to go out and take a side or, defend it or we don't like it, you know, the people who want it are going to spend money and fight for it, but the people who don't really care about it, but they don't want it to happen, but they've lost control of the process because it's not through their elected representatives that are going to debate and talk about it. It's because, you know, you have a group of people who want something to happen and then they bring you to the ballot to do it. So where you know, if you want, if you want them to happen at the same time, then let's just say we want to have those two things happening at the same time. If we want to have it so that the legislative body gets a little bit of an edge, and if people feel that the legislative body is not listening, then they kind of move past the legislative body and they say, "All right, I'm putting this on the ballot. You guys aren't listening." Um, Al had his hand up first. Yeah, thanks, David. I, I um, wanted to point out that in the um, in the current seven seven, the supplemental section. It's not like the it's not like the, the city council is reconsidering something. Uh, right. All that happens is if I go out and get a, a supplemental petition of different people, uh, I, I I go I then go bring it back into the clerk and it gets sent for an election. So they, the 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 city council it'd be one thing if the city council had got a second bite of the apple and said, you know what, after listening to this argument and seeing seeing your uh, additional uh, initiative. We at the council have decided that you know we're gonna we're gonna recommend what you're proposing. That's not at all what's happening here. So I think that the first what's really happening is the the city council takes one look at it, and if they even if they amend it, uh, it's considered to be a, a rejection according to the language in here. And I recall that when citizens were bringing forth the uh, the plastic uh, container uh, an initiative, they brought it they brought it forward as a citizens initiative. Um, and um, uh, the the uh, city council started uh, amending it, making changes to it, and the thing kind of went submarine, went underground for a couple of years, and I think wasn't passed until uh, Tim Dolan offered a, an amendment in 2019 from the council that a, that a, a plastic bottle ordinance was actually adopted. So what began as a citizen initiative was eventually died because you know the people just I think they just I think they were worn out. Uh, and and what happened was the council eventually revived it and said, you know, some of what these folks were talking about was reasonable and sensible, and so they passed it. So I just think that, you know, decide how many people you think is reasonable to initiate uh, a, a citizen initiative to commence it. Uh, let the council see it once, this debate it, this discuss it, figure out what they want to do, and if they if they reject it go to the ballot. I mean, that just seems to me to be, it seems to me that we're, what we're doing is just um, 
really having the, the city council say, okay, you show us that you've got more support. I, I really think of that if they if they've gathered three or four hundred signatures, they probably have the support to put on a campaign. And depending on what kind of campaign they run, they may prevail, but they may not. Even with a thousand signatures, you can still lose an election. So I don't. I just don't see the point because the council doesn't get a second bite of the apple. Are there other communities that do it that way oh, that you know about? Excuse me, oh. excuse me Danny. Catherine? Sorry. Catherine? Hi. Yeah, yes. a, a few sure. thoughts. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of questions that I hear being raised here. Um, one is your last question, David, about do we think that um, there should be these two different forms of government where there is an elected body that is making decisions and where um, where the citizens can petition and can pass laws. And um, I honestly do believe that we need both in order to have a robust representative form of government. Um, and and I heard you say they lose control of the process if it goes if it goes away from their lead. I'm not sure if I understood you correctly, but I would say that sometimes, citizens need the ability to, to take control of the process and to, to be heard. So there's one, it's just how do these two, one question I hear you posing is how do these two forms of government intersect? And I do think it's possible and necessary. That's just where I stand. And two other questions that I hear. One, I'm, I'm hearing a difference of opinion about like the, there's a question about the amount of signatures and there's a question about the pacing of signatures. So in the, I hear you have used the word groundswell a few times, David, and I've heard you all say it should be easy. Um, and that's where I have the biggest opinions. I, I do think that it, that, um, it should not be um, prohibitive. The numbers should not be prohibitive. It should be possible to put something on the ballot and there should be some demonstration that you do have the organizing shops to win to win a campaign to not set things back. I don't know what those numbers are, um, but I hear that's a difference of opinion here: the groundswell versus how easy it is, and then the pacing. And at what at what timing do people submit the the signatures? And that's something I feel like I'm just learning about. Um, and the final thing I just want to name is that I all, I I want to I'm going to complicate it a little bit, but but just I want to echo what Isaac said at the beginning that I the voters definitely voted not to go to seven percent with seven eight, but they didn't vote on absolutely no changes to seven eight. So while I'm on the floor, I just want to say that I'm open to discussing right numbers, right pacing. So that so that it is very possible for people to be heard. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, welcome. I, um, I think we're going to learn a lot talking about seven seven. So if we are to move to seven eight, it'll you know we'll be educated and it'll be it'll be less. Uh... Yes, Isaac. Is he gone? Thank you, David. I'm just unmuting myself. I, I want to answer some of Al's questions or or and, and give them a different perspective or, or share a different perspective and that is as, as someone who sat six terms on the city council right when you're sitting on the city council we're generally councilors are aware of the issues that are being discussed within the community often they're deliberating on those same issues themselves and subcommittee it may not have come up to a vote it may not be getting its way out of out of committee to to be actually voted on by the full council, but it's not that councilors are not don't know about it, and they also because they're having public hearings and because they're getting information from department heads and other state resources. They often have far more information than the general public does that's why we have a representative democracy we elect leaders who can act as our proxy and gather all this information while we're busy about our daily lives. That I agree with Catherine that there should be a bifurcated process and it should be both, we should have access both ways. But when you talk about that second phase, I, it really in the, in the case where the council amends something that's brought before them, 
that I see that as a big reason for the se second phase because it could be that you come up and, and you have a a, a uh, referendum that says no one can wear green socks on Tuesday, and the council looks at it and they have public hearings and they say, okay, we we agree with most of this, but really the issue is where where people are wearing wearing green striped socks is on Tuesday. And, and they adopt the measure with that amendment of stripes, right? And the most of the public may be very well satisfied with what the council did that isn't what was asked for, but is pretty darn close. And the question beca becomes for that second phase is what was the public satisfied with what the council did in responding. And so maybe the question is, if the council outright rejects it, maybe there doesn't need to be more, more um, signatures gathered. But maybe if the council acts in a specific way, um, a sort of rejection, there does need to be. I caution us from bifurcating it because I, I, I think A, it would become confusing just like we did when we bifurcated other things. But also I think it would change the way the council worked. I think they would, they would smart counselors who wanted to reject measures and make them harder would adopt major changes, right? And, and so the question becomes, do, do we work with what the thresholds are and the timing are, which I think are good issues for us all to work with, or do we completely reject the role of the council in being responsive to citizen concerns and initiatives without necessarily adopting them in full as drafted, which often isn't prudent because the drafters, sometimes the very first drafters don't have all the information. Often they want changes made once they get to the council and they learn more. That's all. Thanks, Isaac. Al? Yeah. Um... Uh, Isaac, I, I tend to agree with you, but there's one, one I want to just read some language to you because this may be problematic language to people as well, because uh, I always thought this was strange. This is in 7.7D, Action on Petitions. It says that um, when, when this, uh, the first uh, petition in 7.7, when it gets to, uh, when it gets to the, uh, the council, the council uh, can pass it without change. Um, it can pass a measure which is stated to be in lieu of the initiative measure uh, or by rejecting. So it's got this, there's three things they can do. They can pass it, they can amend it, and they can reject it. And then it also adds language that says, the passes, a passage of a measure which is in lieu of an initiative measure shall be considered a rejection of the initiative measure. Now, maybe that's where the problem is, is that, that I don't know how you deal with this, but I, I remember that when when folks came in with a um, a plastic bottle uh, a plastics ban, um, the the uh, the council did start to to make amendments and changes and and I don't know what the leaders of that initiative thought that uh, well the heck with it you know we're, we're not getting any anywhere here and they they that was just the end of it but what I'm saying is that you've actually got language in here that says if if the city council considers uh, a measure but says we want to tweak you know, so there's not going to be green socks. It's going to be red socks. Um, no pun there. But you know, that would be, would that be considered to be uh, a rejection? Um, maybe that maybe the petitioners will say, "Yeah, we wanted green socks. Uh, you you completely messed it up, and so we want to go out and collect more signatures." But I don't see. I don't really. I don't really see what's happening. I think that if the leaders of a if a leaders of a petition. Go to the council and the council makes changes, makes amendments to it. That that leadership can consider those amendments and say to the council either that evening or later, you know what? We're we're okay with that. We yeah. we believe that this is going to work out and we don't need to reject this because it says the language in here says that if if an if a, an amendment is made, if an initiative is added, it's, con it's considered to be in lieu of what you came in with, we've rejected you. I'm not sure that language is 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 healthy. But I do think that having a second phase in which the council does nothing except wait for you to come back in with more signatures, I see that as, as making no sense practically uh, as, a, as a process that we would want to support. Just it, it accomplishes very little. Yeah, this except is delaying. This is, 
this is a good conversation. I, yeah. I, 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 I could see what you're saying about um, if it's rejected, why should they go out and get more signatures? But I do think uh, Isaac's brought up a good point, which it seems like you've, uh, I think you have, yeah, it's just difficult because what if half the group is pissed about the amendment and the other half isn't? So getting the other signatures kind of gives a more definitive statement about uh, how people feel about it. So again, it's just, these are methods to try to deal with issues that they're not, they may be crude, they may be stupid, um, I don't know, but they're, they're there because you don't want to have it be not, even though everybody thinks this isn't clear, there is clarity in the sense that you go here, you go there, you go here, you go there. So I, I'm just saying, we're, let's, be, let's take up the challenge to see what we can do to make suggestions that would fulfill the things that you're talking about not make it burdensome, but on the other hand, you do not want, because they amended it to Red Sox, for that to go automatically to the ballot. There's nothing in here that says, oh yeah, the petitioners can say it doesn't automatically go to the ballot. There's no way. I mean, it, 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 that's never going to happen. It's not going to work. So well, you have to have a system that, that says automatically. That's all. That's what I'm saying. Well, but, we're trivializing by, by using the, the Sox uh, incident. It, it, it's much more serious than that. When somebody feels that you, you've you've changed the the core and the substance of our recommendation, we want to still proceed. I think that there maybe should be a process that allows the petitioner to to weigh the the recommendation of the council and decide whether to accept it. That's difficult because then who do you talk to? The, That's right. The Five hundred people who signed your signature. But I think that that language about the, that sentence that I read to you about the um, that the uh, uh, measure passed in lieu of the amendment shall be considered a rejection of the amendment. That's clearly written to make the, the petitioners feel like, yeah, you don't have to accept that. You can go on. But I think that all I'm saying is that the second the, the second supplemental does nothing. You know, the council is out of it at that point. They don't do anything further. So so what, what are we really accomplishing by saying to people, okay, sh show us that you got another 300 people you can find. I mean, either tell them up front what you want or, or uh, realize that... Uh, you don't. The council is not playing another a, a role at that point. They're just certifying. You got the clerk certifies your signatures, and then you're on the ballot. So what's the point? Well, all right, uh, Danny, and then Catherine. Okay, so now my question is actually really um, timely. So that is, what is? Do you know of other communities that do it that way, Al, where it go, there isn't that step where it goes right to ballot? And then how do they deal with things like amendments, um, if it's an amendment versus a, a straight rejection, things like that? And we may not know that, but I feel like that's some research we should do. We always borrow from other communities when we're writing things from scratch, which is smart. I'm sure people borrow from us. So I'd be curious to see how other communities deal with that. Uh, Danny, I don't uh, just a quick answer. I don't recall. It's been a while since I've looked at initiatives. Yeah. Uh, referendums, it doesn't exist. I mean, there's no there's no supplemental signature gathering in the referendum process. Uh, I think it's more unusual than usual, but uh, I I it's I really don't recall uh, looking for that particular detail because seven seven never came up. Uh, yeah. The 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 the, the uh, council des decided not to bring that before voters, which. I think actually was a mistake, but um, that that never that never came up. Seven seven was never discussed. I I mean I'd be willing to do some poking around and research to find any communities that, that go You're that on. way. You're on. You're on. Okay, okay. Catherine. I just gave myself homework. I'm wondering why. So earlier, David, you said that the initial number is meant to be easier, and then I think if I'm understanding you correctly, like. It should be an easier number to get to get it in front of city council. And then there's work to be done. But so I'm wondering why the first number is so high and in comparison to the second number, what the rationale of that is. The first number is that to bring it to the city council, there needs to be not less than 10% of the total number, but uh, not let, but not than the total number of voters voting in the most recent biennial city election, but not less than 5% of all registered voters of the same date. And to then bring it from a re rejection at city council to the voters, you need half of that. So if it was meant to be easier at the beginning, why is, what was the rationale for that? If anyone well, you're knows. adding, you're, you're adding an additional amount of voters. So that like, but, I, 
with Al that you're, you know, you have to, yes, you have to go out and get new signatures. So I I'm aware that better. I'm aware that you need to get new signatures, but mm -hmm. the initial number is twice as much as the initial additional signatures. And I'm just wondering what the rationale was for that. Maybe you misunderstood what I said before. What I meant was that you you have a relatively easy number to get before the city council. You have to still have, in my opinion, a groundswell of support to get it there. Then the city council does its thing. And then afterwards, you have to go back and see whether people, whether more people think that that's the wrong thing to do, and then you put it on the ballot. And it's less okay. number, so it's an easier way to, it's easier the second time around because you only need half the people. By then the issue is well in front of the city council, people are very involved in it. And so you go out and get your extra signatures. That's, I think, is the rationale for it. I'm not defending it. I'm just saying that that's the rationale. I think it's a rationale that has merit, but it doesn't mean that there aren't better ways of doing it. And the reason we're seeing already the problems that if we go straight from the city council to the ballot and there's an amendment, then what is, then where's that? Yeah. So maybe this is maybe the numbers are not good. Maybe maybe you're right. Maybe you've you've spotted something where maybe it should be 20 people to get before the city council and 100 people to get it on the ballot. I don't know. I mean, that's OK. But I think that the philosophy is initially that if you go right to the ballot from the council, you could run into the kinds of things that we're talking about, which is that the council's really close, but not, you know, but no cigar. So then it automatically goes to the to the to the uh, to the ballot. So it's just a philosophy that has been copied and imitated, and that's why it's there. It doesn't have to be the right way or the only way, but that's I'm just giving the reason for it. I'm not saying it's a it's a I, I'm not I'm not describing it as stupid or or this or that or it's just that's what that's how people viewed it that you have the legislative body, and if you want to petition your government, you have to get a group of people that are so involved that they create a numbers, and those numbers are then into it. And the city council says, well, we're not, we're not following your lead. And you say, well, guess what? We have, we have a lot of support here, and we're just going to blow right by you and put it on the ballot. But I don't think you, I, I personally don't want 100 people to do that. I don't want 325 people to do that. I want there to be a certain number of people that are out there and really committed to this process before we go out and campaign. By the time it's on the petition, it's on the ballot, then everybody's stuck with it. I'd like to see that groundswell and that energy be there right at the beginning so that when it goes on the ballot, it's clear that there is a push for this. Whatever that number is, we disagree on the number. But that's my that's how I think it should be. But if you tell me that you think it should be different and Al at times has, then I just want you to defend it in terms of that's how our government will be. We'll have low numbers of people putting things on the ballot and we'll be balloting ourselves all over the place. So I was just asking for the rationale of why so many at the beginning and fewer at the end. But thank, thank you. But that's it. Thank I'm you. Dave? Uh, Al. Uh, Isaac's had his hand up for a little bit, Dave. Oh, I'm sorry, Isaac. I, I just wanted to enter a couple of things. I want to entertain what Al was talking about, about, you know, what do we do if we don't collect those additional signatures on an amendment? How do we decide whether or not something goes to the ballot? And it seems to me that the only alternative to that, and maybe I'm just not being creative enough, is giving the choice to the committee, the, the, the top 10 petitioners, the ones who signed the affidavit initially. And my experience has been that those are your most ardent mm -hmm. supporters of whatever the measure are. They're, they're not necessarily representative of the entire public. They are the passionate people for whichever cause it was with or, on any side of the political spectrum. And so because I don't know an answer to that, I, I'm really sort of stuck on the second phase, but I'm wondering if, like, if I thought about how I would put this together, not copying from someone else, I sort of think it should be easier to engage the council and harder to get on the ballot. And so 
I, I know there's another provision that requires the council to take a vote on something um, with, with a small number of votes, but I'm wondering if we should reverse the order and have whatever the smaller number is up front, get the council to take action, maybe give the council a little more than 30 days to consider a major something that's so important that it needs citizens are demanding that we act on it or they're going to go to the ballot. Give councilors 60 days maybe to so a time to have a subcommittee meeting and a public hearing and 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 really do a good job on whatever they're being asked. And then put the onus on if it's amended or rejected outright, put the onus back on that committee to collect the larger number of signatures afterwards, but maybe give them some more time. To collect those signatures because they don't get a lot of time. Um, I'm much less concerned about citizen initiatives than I am about referendum petitions, which I think are much more complicated because they they do involve trying to overturn something that the council has spent a lot of time deliberating on. Usually, um, it seems to me that we could do better at engaging people who want to bring citizens petitions in and engaging the council more in solving those problems. I know you can ask an individual council counselor to do it, but sometimes you do need a group to pressure the council to act because there might be two or three people who are interested in the issue, but getting it to a vote requires at least a majority. And the citizens can per, sort of push the council into taking that action, get some real deliberation on something that might not otherwise even get a hearing because there aren't enough people really interested in it and then give some backside protection to the the general populace by collecting a large number of signatures and showing that ground swell of real support i i don't know if that's better or not but it's certainly different i think it's good thinking yes uh Pat. You're muted. You're mute. Al, you're on mute. mute. Uh, excuse me. Thank I'm you. sorry. The the um the the one of the ironies here is that the question the question uh that happened in in twenty uh, uh twenty twenty one on the ballot um was not a matter of how many signatures um, at all. What, what happened was uh, the city council used section 710 uh, of the charter to take an issue that they thought was pertinent to, from the charter review, that was a uh, particularly a, a citizen driven you know, issue. You know, so these citizen tools, this section seven is largely citizen tools. So let's Let's, as a council, let's put it on the ballot. Let's let the citizens decide what to do with this Section 7-8 because it's their tool. And there's there's some wisdom in that because the, the idea was that we, as you know, members of the council, uh, should not be the ones who are putting their, their thumbprint down on, let's hold back this initiative. Let's, let's, let's not let the citizens vote on this. Uh, with 7-7 and 7-8, and you know, my argument would be that uh, in, in an ideal world, uh, the those issues would always be automatically put on the count on the on the uh, before the voters because it's the voters' initiatives. It's not a council's tool. I understand that the council wants to be able to intervene and say, "No, wait a minute, that's you know that 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 initiative is crazy." But the idea is that we're trying to empower citizens to have a voice in their democracy. Where else can we do it than in a local? in a local democracy. We're certainly not going to see it happen in Congress, but we can do that here. And so the idea is that the irony was that, that in November of 21, the council did not ask for any signatures. They just put this thing directly on the on the ballot. There was no there was no measurement of, of uh, groundswell. Uh, there was one way or another. Uh, there was a council vote about what, uh, putting it on, but that was it. But there, but there was no expectation at all that... Uh, you're going to go out and gather some signatures to show us that the citizens really want it. Instead, what happened was we got the purest form of democracy where we looked at turnout. 
We looked at actual voters voting, who cared, who didn't care, who stayed home, who, who didn't, you know, didn't participate. And that was done without any zero signatures. It was done by the council. So that's the irony about what we're talking about is that on one hand, we have <laughs> section 710, which allows 13 people to say, you know what, this belongs to the voter, we're going to give it to them. And that's why I, I think I don't I don't want to I don't want to see 77 or 78 be that difficult because they are these are the voters tools. Let's let the voters use them and let the chips fall where they may. Sometimes the council will be right, sometimes they're wrong, but let the voters have their voice. That's oh, funny. Oh. That, that is ironic, but it's also okay. in that particular example, I'm just going to say it. I think it's because the council didn't want to deal with it and they should have done this committee that we have now back then and done it then. And I just think they wanted to punt it. I think that was a punt. Um, I, I think there's like a, a super amazing irony, which is that Al asked for it to go on the ballot. One citizen asked for it to go on the ballot and it went on the ballot. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, because they didn't want to deal with it. So how's that? How's that? What kind of? Well, that, David, that's, that that's, that's, a little, that's a little revisionism. Yeah. Actually, well, what happened, what happened was there, 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 there were, there, I think there, there were lots of voices calling for uh, the citizens referendum to be belong to the citizens. Um, I was certainly one of them. Um, but I actually asked, asked, if you go back and look at the email that I sent to you, David, I actually asked, I think it was back in April of 21, I asked for 77 seven and 78 to both be on the ballot because I felt like these are, these are, these belong to the people. It was never my uh, object to just go on with 78. And I'll tell you, I never, ever would have put 78 on the way it was put on with one <clears> fragment <throat> of one sentence being what voters voted on. I, I thought that that was, I, I, in fact, I at one point, I asked the, the town clerk, where's the paragraph that explains what this vote means? And uh, they said, well, th th there's not gonna be one because I was used to the state, the state ballot initiatives would always say, if you vote yes on question one, here's what happened. If you vote no, here's what happened. So we had to have a campaign to explain to people what on earth this fragment meant. We'll, we'll so believe me, it this. wasn't we'll my, you know, I, I didn't want to go on the ballot with seven, Al, eight. Al, uh, we'll I wanted to decent disagree. seven, eight to begin with. Okay, go ahead, Derek. Uh, thank you so much. So I'd like to say, you know, I, I respect Al's voice on this, but I think a voter's biggest representative is this person they elected, right? So their voice is their elected official. And I, I think we kind of undermine our elected officials in both 7778. So the first step should always be reaching out to your local selectman, councilman, you know, representative, whatever it may be, to voice your opinion. We're here to listen. That's what we're here for, right? That should be step number one. I understand um, we're voted in our precincts by, you know, people that have put trust in us to be in that position, right? So just to say that that these mechanisms are the only way for a voter to voice their opinion is incorrect, if you ask me. Secondly, I, I do agree with um, Isaac on, you know, I think the better approach is, is to lower the amount to get something brought in front of the council. But, you know, the council is aware of a lot of situations going on in the city that the general public, like Isaac has said, might not be aware of or, or things that they're just not aware of. So Let's get it in front of us so we could have the conversation and educate the public as well at the same time. Let us voice our vote. And if they don't agree with our vote, then yes, make it a harder number to put it on a ballot. And then once it's on the ballot, you let the citizens decide. I, I think it's pretty straightforward, actually. And that's Thank all I had you. to say. Thanks, Derek. Uh, Isaac. So I. I don't think it's ironic at all that councilors put that question on the ballot. I, and I disagree that no signatures were collected. 850 signatures at minimum were collected by the councilors to run for office. And then a majority of the citizens in their respective precincts elected them. You know, they're there. Yeah, they have more, they have more information than the average person, but they're there because they are in tune with the voters in their respective precincts. I admit, and this is why I said at the beginning, we now have four-year terms, and sometimes counselors become out of touch over the course of those four-year terms. And so it's important to have this release valve. The citizen initiative process and the referendum processes are release valves, but they're not intended to be the primary way 
that we do government. They should be accessible. They should be understandable. They should be able to be accomplished and, and they should be understandable, but it shouldn't be our first recourse and our system should be designed that the first recourse is direct communication with your counselor followed by all of the lesser things. This is really a resource of last resort is the way I see it. And, and so while it's not a, it, it shouldn't be um, impossible, and I, I question on whether or not you should have to collect more than two times the amount of signatures required to run for countywide office in a much shorter period of time. So I, I don't think Al is wrong on the number of signatures or the timeline, but it, certainly it's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be what you do when nothing else works. That's the way I see it. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, yes, Al. You're muted again. You're muted, Al. You're muted. Yeah. We understand you by your body language, but we can't hear you. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm clicking one and not the other. Mm -hmm. uh, my apologies. I, I have never advocated uh, that going to the ballot is the only way for citizens to express their opinions. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's, it's, my, it's my place of last resort. I don't, like, I don't ever like doing it because, it's, frankly, it's hard work. And the older I get, the harder it becomes. So I'm not an advocate. And one of the reasons I'm involved in this committee is that I'm not a, I'm not trigger happy to go to the ballot uh, for anything. Uh, I, and what and and David can tell you that I sat through many evenings of the Charter Review Committee. Sometimes I was the only person from the public staying up with the committee to listen to what they were saying. Wrote many memos. If you look at the list of memos. Uh, that I wrote to the Charter Review Committee, there was a long list. So going to the ballot was not, not my first instinct. My first instinct was, I'm going to work with my elected officials to come up with, with ways of, of trying to solve these, these charter issues to make it uh, 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 an avenue that citizens can use when they feel it's necessary. And sometimes it is necessary. But I am not a uh, first resort use of these mechanisms. I'm a last resort uh, and I don't, that's why I don't want to see it. I don't, I don't want to see this process break down because I don't particularly want to see another uh, ballot question brought on referendums. Uh, it's the last thing I want to see happen in this town. Uh, it was extremely divisive and I don't, I don't recommend it to anybody. And on 7-7, I'm, I'm looking for that balance that makes it something that we actually can use practically when we need it because the initiatives uh rarely come forward. We don't, we, that one's more rusty than the referendums. The referendums, you can count on them from time to time, but these are not overworked uh, uh, tools. These are not citizens who are avoiding uh, their elected officials. I go to many more subcommittee meetings than most, uh, than most public citizens uh, uh, of the city council. You know, I've, I'm, I'm there often. Uh, so I, uh, Derek, I'm, I'm someone who believes strongly in using the committee process to try to uh, uh, leverage uh, what, what what citizens might think and to write about what citizens might think. Um, so uh, you know, and I and I also believe that um, that we should have these mechanisms are important to be decided by citizens because they are mechanisms that are only used by citizens. They are not they are not counselors' mechanisms. Fortunately, counselors can use Section Seven Ten anytime they want without any signature. So I do think there's a a big distinction about why this is so important for citizens uh, and people who are on this call who are not on the committee to be to be uh, uh, feeling that th this is the way we contribute to our democracy. One of the ways we do it. It's not the only way because a lot of the people that are on this call tonight are people who are frequently in front of their counselors at committee meetings. Thanks. Thanks, Al. Uh, I'm going to let Catherine. So I'm. I'm new to how these meetings are facilitated and I'm not sure how this would happen in a meeting like this, but facilitating outside of city council meetings, there's like the taking the temperature of the room. And I'm hearing several people, Isaac's talked about this, I've talked about this. Um, I think Derek, you might've maybe also mentioned that. I think that there, I'm, I'm getting a sense that there could be agreement Perhaps I'm not sure where you stand on this allergy, but um, to start playing with the numbers so that the 
there could be fewer numbers, it could be far easier for citizens to bring a petition to city council and that there we could start playing with with those numbers. And I'm wanting to, I don't know what the mech outside of here, we often look at thumbs like, yes, I support that. I don't really know, or I, I really disagree. You know, um, that's one way to get a visual take on a room. Um, but I'm I'm looking at the time and I'm curious what is coming out of here. And that's one, it's not as strong as emotion, but like a, a some type of proposal that do we want to start looking at numbers um, and have something different to look at chew on next time, um, having far lower numbers um, to bring something to city council and perhaps the higher numbers to actually get it to the ballot. One part of that question is how do, how is the temperature taken in a city in a subcommittee meeting like this as a facilitator? And two, is that something that we want um, okay. to do? Well, take, taking the temperature is it's quarter of this meeting is scheduled to last till eight. And everybody's been talking around the issues. So yeah. might, this might be a good time to summarize. Can I? Uh, but I know Danny wants to talk also. Um, I like your idea. I, I feel like it's the first meeting and I personally would like to have us digest what has been said before we, you know, give us a chance, give us a month to think about it. Yeah. Al's got a long plane ride. He's going to need stuff to think about. Um, and the next meeting, maybe uh, Danny can bring a, uh, you know, another version that she sends to us ahead of time that we can look at. Got my list to work out of. And um, I do hear that there's a general feeling about the, about going forward this way. And, and I think it's I think it's really good. I think the conversation's been really good. And uh, I'm just wanting to, you know, Derek hadn't spoken yet. I just want to hear what everybody has to say. Um, so I wasn't, I didn't, I couldn't tell you what the temperature is, but it feels like no that we don't nobody that the committee doesn't have a fever yet. So um, go ahead, Danny. Yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like the temperature is that we're mostly in agreement on some of the philosophies, some of the, some, some of the changes that could, it sounds like we're all in agreement to make it a little more accessible to a certain extent, but that we recognize that the legislative body has a place in Greenfield and that there are options for going to them. Like, I really agree with what Isaac said, which I love you, Isaac, but you know, that kills me a little bit. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> political opposites in the past, but not so much about this kind of stuff. I love, you know, so I just want to say that it doesn't sound like this is, I was going to say something else, but I feel like it's not, not, applicable now that Catherine spoke. Yeah, I was going to say something along the lines of first meeting is like talking about philosophy, where we're all standing, the history. I feel like second meeting might be some digging into some of the meat of what could be. And I'm going to do my, uh, do research to see if there are any communities in Mass that do that straight to the ballot thing and how they address some of the issues that could come up that way. Thank you. If I were to summarize, I would say that there were two competing concerns. One is that we want, some of us would like to see the legislative body be a strong piece of, of uh, government elected by, by the voters. And that's where they, in one component of government, have their ability to decide what, who, who to represent their interests. So, and so that means, and then the, the other is to make it, to, to make sure that everything doesn't go to the ballot. So it sounds like we've, we've kind of both, we've all agreed that it seems like with the suggestions that are being made, we're, we're making, um, we're certainly heading in the direction of making it easier for the, for people to get before the city council to have to make uh, binding decisions. I, I just remember then, the word I meant to say was rare. I wrote it down. I mean, that's kind then, of what Isaac. And then also, you know, having the the caution to make sure that um, if things are going to go to the ballot, that they have to have some sort of a threshold. 
Maybe we haven't decided the threshold yet, but I think people understand it as a concept. Um, so I think we're in agreement. I think we've talked about that. I, I see that Al has his hand up and would like to say something. So uh, go ahead. Go ahead, David, finish the thought. Yeah, so I, I'm really glad that that's the case. It feels like there's, um, there's actually some thoughtfulness here and the thoughtfulness is kind of a blending of, of what, what I think we once thought were ideas that we couldn't really share with each other, but we are. And so I'm feeling some hopefulness about it. I mean, obviously the devil's in the details, see where it goes. But um, I think conceptually we're talking about, we're talking about good, I think we're on the same place talking about similar things. I, I could be wrong, um, but um, so that's, that's how I wanna leave it. Um, go ahead, Al. I, I would like to feel that uh, uh, that this community, the city council and the community uh, work together and that the council welcomes uh, the, the opinions and the, the uh, efforts of citizens to weigh in. That that's the kind of community that attracts me, not one where I feel like uh, we're, we're throwing obstacles in the way of people who, who want to uh, have a role to play in a, a, small, a small city government. Um, I, I believe that um, our citizens have acted responsibly in the past, that they've not misused the process, um, that they've brought important new information to the table sometimes about what they want and don't want, and that that's what the council is there to do, is to represent uh, what their people want. And sometimes, like we did in November of, of 2021, we put something on the ballot and we get a result that tells us something about what people want. Maybe not everything that that people wanted to, to hear or, or with a message that was completely clear because of the nature of the question. But I, I'm, to me, that's stimulating that, that the council said, okay, people, tell us what you want. We're going to let you decide and mean it and seriously mean it. So I think that I don't want to, I don't want to see, you know, uh, something that is uh, um, uh, elongated, uh, that requires double takes of gathering signatures. I don't think that makes a lot of sense. I do think that, uh, that we can design, everything needs a threshold. And I think we can design a threshold that works for 7-7 without discouraging people from using it because frankly, it doesn't get used very often. And I think we know the reason why is the way it's written now is, 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 uh, is, is, uh, is challenging to say, to say the least to voters. So I'm hoping that we can uh, sh certainly make it reasonable for people to get on the ballot uh, and to not uh, create uh, unnecessary steps that just draw out the process and discourage people. So I, 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 and I don't, I really don't want this, you know, counselors, I know this is hard to, to, to make happen, but I don't want counselors to feel that citizens are being adversarial with their counsel when they say, we disagree with you. you know, we just, we, we're just trying to, uh, you know, stick a, a, you know, a stick in your eye or something. That's not the feeling that I get from people when they say that they want to bring an issue to, to the ballot. So I, I hope that that, uh, you know, can, can seep in that that this is not this is not adversarial outside versus inside. Uh, this is all we're all one part of a, a of a government. Thank you. Good, good place to end. Um, anybody else have anything to say? Okay. Um, meeting meeting uh, dates and times is for those who said that the evening is better. Catherine and Derek. Um, is six, six o'clock still a good time? It it all depends on the day for me, but I, I can make six work. I'll probably be in my truck still, but I'll make it work. All right, was it was it okay to, to be in the meeting in your truck this time? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, actually kind of quiet. I've been sitting outside my house for an hour. <laughs> I'll be right over. Um, all right, so what? <laughs> What day of the week is this? Uh, is Tuesday? I mean, I don't. I haven't really looked. We did this. Uh, there's a gap. You know, there's. Uh, this is the very end of the month is good because the council finishes its business except for the um, community relations. So everything's finished by this council meeting except for community relations. If we go earlier in the month, then we're going to be fighting with other with planning boards and zoning boards and things of that nature. So. Um, 
but I won't, I mean, I don't, I no, but on the other hand, I, I don't want to, I'd rather take, I'd rather the next meeting be in January myself personally. So. Well, I, I think we should wait till Al gets back for sure, but can we get a, can we try a doodle poll again? I thought that worked well once you figured it out. Yeah. Who knew that, who knew that Greenwich mean time was the, was the standard of a doodle search <laughs> for Derek. <laughs> Derek was like, I ain't doing no nine o'clock in the morning. All right, we can do a doodle poll. Uh, does that work for everybody? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and I support uh, you and not, I won't be able to yeah. make the last, the last week of December. So. Right. Yeah, good. You support that, right? Yeah. yeah but thank you for not, I'm, I could, I could make my it. My doodle will longer. start, my doodle will start in January. <laughs> How's that? That's a promise. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. That gives me lots of time to do my homework. I'm going to, since it's, I'm going to say that we're adjourned. I wish you all a very, very happy holiday. Although, counselors, I'm probably going to watch you in your committee, so you'll see me. Al, have a safe trip. Thank you, David. And um, we'll see you in January. Thanks a lot. It was really Thank good. You. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.